Comedy legend Louis Black is bringing Goodbye Yeller Brick Road, the final tour, to Steelhouse on Sunday, February 25th. Tickets go on sale Friday, November 17th at 10 a.m. Get yours at SteelhouseOmaha.com. The holidays start here at Baker's with a variety of options to celebrate traditions old and new. You could do a classic herb roasted turkey or spice it up and make turkey tacos. Serve up a go-to shrimp cocktail or use Simple Truth wild-caught shrimp for your first Cajun risotto. Make creamy mac and cheese or a spinach artichoke fondue from our selection of Murray's cheese. No matter how you shop, Baker's has all the freshest ingredients to embrace all your holiday traditions. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Hey, it's Story Worthy. Today on the show, comedian Blanca Patch talks about being California sober. The March that we went into lockdown, I guess that Friday the 13th, I figured, hey, I'll take March off. I'm just going to take a break in March. I'm just not going to drink. And I just stopped drinking. I didn't quit. I just stopped. I just didn't drink. And, uh, and it wasn't really a problem. And then I got to the end of, I got to the end of the month and, uh, and I was like, I'm just going to keep going. And I kept going and it's been a year and almost four months, I guess. And I do not miss it at all. But, but I smoke marijuana all day, every day. Today on the show, comedian and writer Blanca Patch talks about being California sober. Stick around. Hey, it's Blaine Kapach, and you're listening to Storyworthy. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show of 12 years or you're a new fan, welcome to Storyworthy. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed the show last week with comedian Esther Koo. Esther is one of the funniest girls I've ever chatted with. First of all, I love her voice. Just her voice is just tremendous, and she's just an incredibly talented person. Last week, she told a story about being in high school. She grew up in Chicago, and she wrote for the newspaper, but she got really touchy with the newspaper and with the people that live in her area and started calling out, like, the rich kids and how they bought their way into the valedictorian and into the homecoming queen, and the shit hit the fan, man. Esther got into all kinds of trouble, and it's just a hilarious hilarious episode. So go back, you guys, and listen to Esther Koo. But not today. Stick with me now, because today I'm kicking off my 12-year anniversary with the extremely talented writer and comedian, Blaine Patch. Here he is right now. Hey, Blaine. Hey, Christine. <laughs> I'm so happy to talk with you. Oh, I didn't know we were going to go and go past the hi, Christine. Yeah, we're going to go a little farther <laughs> past. You know what's interesting? Now, my podcast, 12 years in July, that was the first I, you know, the, the first show I put out was 2010, July 10th. So it is a big occasion, 12 years. I've been with a couple of different networks. I've had ads on my show, then I don't have ads on my show, and then I make money, and then I make no money. And recently, I dumped my network. So there we go again. And it's because I've had the same network for like a year, and I know my audience can hear McDonald's ads and all these big ads on my show. So everybody out there is probably thinking like, oh, Christine's doing great. But actually, the network hasn't been paying me appropriately. Can you imagine that, Blaine? It's it's hard to believe <laughs> because I'm brought to you today by Catcher Schmidt, the axe catching place. <laughs> catching an axe. <laughs> Stay sharp at Catcher Schmitz. Catch an axe. Oh my God. Hey, do you ever play har- do you ever play hot sharpie with your son? What's hot sh- hot sharpie? Hot sharpie is just when you take the cap off a sharpie and toss it back and forth. And Oh no. That's a lot of fun. No. And see who gets the most marker on them. We just play that with a knife, and it has the the same basic effect. If it lands on you wrong, it marks you. I call it hot knives. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, heating it up would be good. 
<laughs> Usually with a Sharpie, I just take the cap off and I uh, just toss it in the dryer. It's a great fabric softener. Not a lot of people know that. Take the cap off, toss it in, forget about it. That'd be really fun. Just put, like with your son or my daughter, put some white T-shirts in a, you know, in the laundry with just Sharpies. That'd be a fun little experiment. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fuck up the entire <laughs> laundry room for your apartment complex. And then sell the shirts. You just got rich. <laughs> Anyway, you know, like I know, that podcasting is just another art form. You know what I mean? You got your comedy. You got your theater. I don't know. Singing. That's an art. You Mm -hmm. got your painting. And um, things change. Cooking. Cooking. And things change. So we come in and we come out. So I'm out. I've just got out of the contract with my podcast network. But really, ladies and gentlemen, it's about you and me anyway. You know what I mean? It's about you tuning in to me, listening to me bring you guys brilliant guests like today's guest, Blanket Patch. So nothing's going to change on your end for the podcast listener. I'm just telling you what's going on in my world. And as I kick off my, my 12th year podcasting, I'm, uh, I'm on my own again, Blaine. I'm on my own. Well, you've graduated. Twelve years is like a is like a school education. It's first through twelfth grade. <laughs> exactly. You've got you know it's a it's a long time to be doing something, and uh, uh, you you step out of that skin like a like you're molting, and then you move on with a shiny new awareness. That's right. Twelve years podcasting, Blaine. I have made hundreds of dollars. Oh my God! You're kidding me. What's that after taxes? I'm a hundred air, hundred air. <laughs> I'm worth about eighty bucks. Nothing wrong with that. Oh man! Hey, listen. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, and you bring forth the topic California sober, and so I'm anxious to hear your point of view on this. And for anybody out there that doesn't know what California sober means, it's that you're not drinking alcohol, but you are smoking weed. Yes. And I, I do want to. I do want to disclaim this. This morning, I saw a clip of of the very funny Josh Gondelman doing a very funny bit about this topic. Mm-hmm. So I, please don't think I'm stepping on no, him. No. But it, but it just happens to be the thing that we were talking about. You you asked me. Uh, uh, Hey, maybe let's discuss sobriety. Yeah. Do you remember in 1996? I don't know where you were. Maybe you were in Baltimore. Maybe you were in San Francisco. I was in- I was in San Francisco in 90. No, I was down here in 96. I oh. just I came down here in 95. Do you remember when they opened up California to medical marijuana? I do. It was 96. But it was a big deal. It was it was a big deal and it wasn't like it wasn't easy to get to. I had one of before they started opening dispensaries and that kind of stuff. I was going to uh I had a doctor over in the valley and he'd go over and give him 50 bucks and he'd you know, go, you have anxiety, right? Yeah, yeah I guess. Well, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> you write a thing, and then you go get pot, and it was a big hassle. And were your weed dealers all Russian? Mm, no. My my doctor was an African-American guy, and my dealers were all uh, Valley dudes, like either, either muscly... Yeah. Barbed wire tattoo dudes or uh, uh, Hispanic dudes. I'm surprised La- Latino guys. you went all the way to the valley because, you know, like in Hollywood and Koreatown, there were so many dispensaries. You know, I didn't I didn't ever find one in my area that I liked. Yeah. There was one that was close, but it was they're all really pricey. I found a nice one over in the valley. Oh, that that's I good. Yeah, I have a yeah, it's like a cheers thing. I walk in there. Blame. <laughs> Making your way to the car today takes everything you got. <laughs> Trying to find your keys and, and where I left my phone on the dash. Well, it used to be like, you know, I remember going into weed stores and all the weed was in big glass jars. And you could open up the jar, smell the weed, even touch mm-hmm. the weed. And then there'd be like a, a dude standing there. And then behind, you'd see like a little curtain. And if you look behind the curtain, you'd just see stacks of cash. You know, just like it, it was always. <laughs> so like wow yeah, machine guns on the table yeah, and it stuff it seemed like real drugs were happening and you know except it was just weed but i would actually sit and play backgammon with these russian dudes and smoke with them and like it was so it was kind of fun oh okay yeah mine was mine was mostly uh, uh just sort of mainstream white guy dudes yeah yeah 
And now, yeah, not, of course, it's all changed in California. And like it's all completely changed. like maybe 35 or 40 other states. It's recreational, of course. And, you know, there's um, deals to be had. That's for sure. Well, <clears throat> uh, I don't know how the deals are happening, because every time I go into new dispensaries, they uh, they have the worst use of floor space of any business. I don't know how they stay open. It's like the new Star Trek Enterprise, where every, it's like, you're in outer space. Space is at a, a premium here. You can't have these big walkways. Yeah. But you go into a dispensary, and there's like two counters... <laughs> And nine people working there with headsets. There's always nine and, people working. And, yeah, and there's a display. It's like I just want to. I just want a jar of Jeter's. It's like, well, let me contact Phil in the back, and then he'll mark down this thing. And they put it in a white bag. It's it's still too much. It's, like, it's still too much. It's like when you go to Old Navy and they're wearing those headsets, like they're landing planes. They're not yeah, landing planes. They're selling pants. Yeah, just tell point point me t- at, at where my size might be, and I'll find it myself. I don't want to trouble trouble you for more than more than it's worth. So now at dispensaries, you know the legal cannabis places. Yeah, like you said, there's just well, a lot of them are actually like Seven Eleven, where there's just so many products, all different kinds of products. There's ointments and tinctures and smells and sprays, and just to find yeah, vapes. and vapes and just to, just to find like a regular bud, like just to get a joint seems so complicated. It really, it, well, it is. It's like, oh, you're looking for flour? Hmm. No. No, I just want to. I just want to. I just want to smoke weed. Well, the I just please. The one I go to now, the dispenser I go to now, you know, for me, it's always based on the price and the selection. And so, where I go now, down on Sunset at CCA, big shout out to the CCA Collective. Um, they, CCA you can't, something. you can't touch anything. You can't touch the counter. You can't put your money on the counter. You can't put your wallet on the counter. You can't touch the goddamn counter. So now it's like everything has to happen like just vocally. Like, like what do you have in a sativa? And then they'll open the drawers. <laughs> it's all very, I, I don't know. Like you don't really see yeah, the it's product. Like, I don't like, I don't like uh, announcing what I'm buying. It's like going to a pharmacy. Yes, I need some <laughs> hemorrhoid cream. <laughs> Hemorrhoid. They're very bad. <laughs> V-A-L-T-R-E-X. X as in X-Files. Valtrex. Yes, Blaine Kapatch. Yes. Yes, yes, the comedian, Blaine Kapatch. I'm on at blank patch on Twitter. Well, listen, you know, it, it, you know, this town, it ebbs and flows and, you know, it's all an art. And I do feel successful just staying here. I feel like a success just from coming from Pittsburgh and being here, staying here. I've been here 25 years in, in August. And how about okay. you, Blaine? Because you've had some magnificent jobs and then no job. I mean, how, yeah. how does it work for you? The art of Los Angeles. Well, it's it's uh, uh, it like you said, it ebbs and flows. Uh, uh, it's I think the thing that happened to me anyway was the uh, I lost a little momentum in the pandemic, mm. and so it's a little little a uh, little hard to get to want to get back on my footing because it's like uh, the stuff that I was doing before the pandemic, you know, doing working on this or going out to to the, these clubs or whatever, it got a little uh, uh, just I'm old and I don't want to do that. I want to stay home with my kid. And now I have now I'm like I like it so I'm trying to figure out how to how to do that how to how to keep the keep the ebb working for me. Well, but a lot of <laughs> work the, work the ebb. A lot of what you're doing is writing. So Blaine isn't like yeah, you know, well, do you feel like you need to be in a writers room to get it accomplished or can you not do that on your I own? I miss being in writers rooms. Because uh, 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 I've been working on Hanging with Dr. Z. It's uh, Dana Gould's show where he's Dr. Zayas and he introduces or he in- interviews people space ghost style. And he's uh, a bunch of us get together and we sit at a picnic table and we write jokes for it. Uh, and it's it was such a relief to be able to do that again after the pandemic. Yeah. But I don't yeah. mind writing by myself. I can I can write by myself with no problem. But I, I do I do miss the I do miss being able the immediacy of saying something and everybody reflects it immediately and then 
everybody gets another two or three jokes out of the same thing. That's what I, that's yeah, exactly. what I exactly. That's what I meant. Yeah, and you're sitting across from Dana Gould, who's absolutely brilliant. So really, you guys writing together to throw out an idea and then to get that immediate, you know, like oh yeah, that's something or well, no. Also, also, I think as a as a writer, if you know, if you're there and you're working with people that you know and you're in the room you can say hey how about how about we do this and they can immediately say well we wouldn't do it like that because of this why don't we do this and then everybody can immediately go from from the new position of here's what we can do and so it sounds like you get more work you done get more when work done more faster because it's like i would get an idea and i'll go okay i'll write out I'll take a, you know, however long it takes me to write out a page of this idea or write a script for it. And then they read it and go, oh, this is funny, but we can't do it. So I mm-hmm, skip that whole mm-hmm. step. And that, yeah, that's a nice step to skip because yeah. if there's no sense in going forward, then you can save time. Yeah, and also, also things are more organic and fun when you're in a room with people. I think it's easy yeah. to do that on a Zoom meeting, too. Like when you're doing it on, like right now, it's it's so much more fun being able to... You just feel like you're in a room with somebody. It's like the future. It's like the Jetsons. I'm telling you. No, I hear what you're saying. There's a lot. There's a a lot of things have changed, you know, in terms of the podcasting world. The first like 600 episodes I did, I had to have the person with me and like in front of me. Like for some reason, I put all this emphasis on like I have to feel the vibe (laughs) or I have to know the person. Like it's so stupid because now, you know, I've done another 150 episodes and nobody's in person and nobody ever probably will be in person because I can get better guests by not making them come somewhere. Well, uh, uh, there, there is that. I don't, I've, I've, I don't mind doing that. I think that when I go to somebody, somebody's uh, podcast, if I go to a studio or their place or whatever, it puts me in a different mindset going over there. I, I see and think different things. It's a new experience. So I'll, it'll, it'll, it'll put me in a different headset for a different thing instead of being I'm sorry if I'm talking around it a little bit no 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 no. it's just all I'm saying is like I think zoom is pretty much just as good yeah, you know, I don't mind when you're it. looking at somebody in the eye and like we're all being normal and it's not like you have to be dressed up or have makeup on or you know what I mean? You could just still look at the person and get what's going on. Well, it's better for me because I can I can do like a, a bit like where I can put on like too many glasses or something. <laughs> and because uh, my glasses are on my desk, and then I can do the thing where I have too many glasses on. Oh, the physical humor! Yeah. I think I know what you're saying. And it's like even if even if this isn't going out on the on the air, it, even if people can't see that, you can see it, and, and I you think giggle it's funny. It, at it. <laughs> oh my god! Hey, Blaine, let me ask you something because you have done a lot of things. I mean, and again, it's all art, so it sort of all kind of comes in and out of the same thing. I mean, but so there's the writing and then you tell jokes. But at one point, and I know it's about 20 years ago, but you were actually a game show host. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was about 20 years ago. I was I hosted Beat the Beat the Geeks on Comedy Central. Yes. Now, besides the fact that you're getting money and you do know a lot about nerdy, geeky stuff. Did you enjoy the job? Oh, yeah, I did. I really enjoyed it. The geeks are were were cool guys, and we're still all good friends. Uh, I remember those were like the smartest dudes in the world. Yeah. And you have to go on and try to be smarter than these people oh, that are just like brilliant. I didn't have to be. I didn't have to be smarter than those guys. No, you didn't. They did. They, oh, they, the they did. But they they it was effortless for them. Those guys were yeah. just sort of those. You know, like you can. They open their eyes and you see the numbers falling in front of them, Matrix style. <laughs> all those guys. <laughs> I know, but I'm talking about the contestants on the show. Oh. They had to try to beat the geeks, you know, no more than the than the geeks. People are always su- like... people are always surprised at how much they don't know. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it was but, but it was always it was it was uh, uh, it was always fun. Everybody had a good time on that show. But I guess what I'm asking you is, you know. At the end of the day, when you're a game show host, you can only go so far. I mean, you are very much committed to facilitating the game and making it go forward. It's not really about you. You know what I mean? Oh, no, of course. So you have to think a lot as a game show host. You need to think a lot. you got to stay on task, and you have to listen to these producers telling you to get it going, move it on, oh, etc. Yeah. There's not as much artistic freedom, I'm just saying, no, not as at a all. game show host. No. So how... That's what I'm saying. So, but but you you still thought it was great because 
other, other things I said. Well, I got to be a game show host, which was the best part. But it yeah. was, uh, 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 they had, all my stuff was in prompter, all my, my, the things mm. that I had to say because there were so many legal things that they had to come down with, uh, uh because of the $64,000 question stuff. But there's yes. so many, so many laws and so many legal entanglements that they avoid. I have to re- be very specific. Uh, uh, there would be a, a, a guy from, from legal, I can't remember what his title was, but an older guy named Albert, I think. And as soon as they would go hold or if there would be a break in taping, he would yeah. come out immediately and stand between me and the contestants. I was not allowed to have any kind of contact with them. Wasn't allowed to just like, hey, how you doing? You enjoying your stay in Los Angeles? Yeah, any wow. any of that stuff. I couldn't have any contact with them. Because you could be cheating. I could be cheating or, or giving them thinking. signal. Yeah, yeah, it's like they were just covering all their bases. And uh, uh, I wouldn't get a script for the show until the night before. We would ha- uh, they would send a, a PA over and give me the script, and I would have to sign for it. And then I would read it just to make sure I could pronounce everything. It was basically just like a, a run to make sure I knew what was coming at me. And then, uh, uh, and then the next day I would take the script back, and I would have to sign it back out, and then they would destroy it. Wow. But, oh, hey. wow, why was that so secretive? Because because uh, uh, it had all the ans- the questions in it. It's like, oh. yeah, here's, here's the, you know, here are the categories, whatever. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really had a, pe- a valuable piece of paper in your yeah, hand. Yeah, it was good. Can I tell you, my, uh, can I tell you my, my big show business story? I, of course. I, I love big show business uh, stories. The, uh, guess who the intern was that would bring me the script before tape nights? Polly Shore. Kato Kalin, Angeline. Do you want two more? Um. Um. Okay. Chris Hardwick. Um. <laughs> Bill Hader. <laughs> oh! <laughs> no. It was fantastic. It was way. It was great. No way. Yeah. He was. No way. Uh, uh, he would. Barry. He would come over. Yes. He would come over and drop the script off, and it was during the the Robert Blake trial. And I would yes. go, hey, man, why don't you come on in? I'm a drinking tequila and smoking pot and watching the Robert Blake trial. And he'd go, no, nah. and he'd go, no, man, I have to get back to the back to the office. He was always you should have wagered. You should have wagered with him when they would convict him or when they would arrest him. <laughs> he was. Uh, uh, yeah, that was uh, oh, poor Robert Blake. Not poor Robert Blake, but yeah, fuck that guy, man. He's still over there living in the valley. He's probably got several guns now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> still long distance dating these women. Leaving them in a lot of. I'm leaving a lot of guns in a lot of booths these days. I know. I love his excuse. Oh, honey, I got to run back to the restaurant. I forgot my gun. Yeah, I left the murder weapon and where we were sitting. <laughs> when I come back out, you'll be you'll be dead. That's my alibi anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but listen, uh, Bill Hader, what a talent. Do you watch Barry? Have yes. You seen Barry? Oh, my God. <sighs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> the, the, Just when you think, like, they, there's no way they can get better television, and then boom, I can't stop. Barry. I can't stop thinking about that motorcycle chase. Oh, my gosh. I can't stop gosh. thinking about it. I think about it every day. It's so Everything about it is funny. The, I, the, In the second season. Second season. The, this, the one that just happened, yes. Yeah, the last. Uh, uh, yeah, second or third. The... Uh, where there, because there's there's so many elements in it. Everything is funny about it. There's so many. Everything yeah. is funny, but the the thing that I've been thinking about the last few days is uh, uh, when the motorcycles are chasing them through the cars, like they're when they're lane splitting on the freeway, and they're yeah, yeah. and they're the motorcycles that are the bad guys with the helmets are chasing them, yeah. and they're like <laughs> 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 that they're that they're yelling at each other, but they can't understand. It was that was such a because of the helmets, yeah, such so a little thing, but that. it was such a yeah. oh, such a fantastic joke. Yeah, Barry is like this violent and, and you know this incredibly violent show with drug kingpins and all this stuff. But then they add so much humor. Yeah. in the dialogue, the dialogue is like they're all very much regular guys. This just happens to be what they do. It's it's uh, <laughs> uh, funny from stem to stern. <laughs> So Bill Hader was your PA. Jesus Christ, Blaine. Can you believe it when you see what happens to certain people in their stardom? Uh, I went to see him at UCB right before he went to New York. I think I've told this story on podcasts before, but yeah. uh, I went to see him before uh, 
and he was just he was so funny. I'd seen him a couple times at UCB. Just just like, oh, this guy's really good. And then he yeah. got SNL. It's like great. And then uh, right before he left, he saw me and said, "Hey, I just wanted to say you were one of the only people that was nice to me. Thank you for being nice oh to my me." Oh my god! And it, it just uh, uh, so be nice to people because they yeah, might be no Bill kidding. Hader. Yeah, no Unbelievably shit. funny no guy. Shit. Him doing Lindsey yeah. Buckingham every time, just <laughs> always getting bumped. And just sitting there in full makeup as Lindsey Buckingham and always getting bumped and always being cool about it. It's just such a such a Tim Conway thing to do. Just uh Yeah, oh, that's funny. Committing to I, it. I I I you know, I got a lot of my comedy chops from my father. And my dad, Jack Blackburn boy, he loved Bob Newhart, Tim Conway, mm-hmm. Harvey Korn. Oh, yeah. Carol Burnett, I mean all that. Yeah. That's you know that was Jack Blackburn all the way. He like his favorite show was Soap. You know, remember the sitcom oh, yeah. Soap with Danny and everything. And I remember um, being in church one day, and it was like the time for the priest to talk, the sermon part. And he told everybody in the congregation, "You write to ABC because they have hired a, a character to play a homosexual." And I remember looking down the pew at my dad, like. You love that show. <laughs> I love that show. You know what I mean? My like, parents wouldn't let me watch it. The, oh, wow. Yeah. Well, my dad was way into all the funny stuff, all in the family, all that. And I got so much of my, my comedy from him. I just felt like, you know, he knew he knew Monty Python. Like, my dad just, he, he was on that, that humor train. And I feel lucky to have got that from him. Oh, well, uh, uh, my dad was the exact same way. It was. I think the 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 soap thing was. I think more of my mom. My mom went through a little bit of a religious like hmm, Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. I don't know, but yeah. uh, uh, but they would. I would watch like my dad would let me stay up to watch Carson monologues. I would always watch yeah. Bob Hope. They would let me stay up to watch Mad 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 World if it was on. Oh, I love like, that movie. Just, uh, all all that stuff. It, they had great taste in comics and stuff. Was- was a mad, 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 mad world as long as I think it yeah, was? Yeah, it was Wasn't very that like a super long. Yeah, movie? it was very, very long. Has an inter- intermission. Going, like, there's a built-in intermission. Yeah, <laughs> there is. There's an intermission in it. <laughs> wow! And I just remember at the end those big palm trees, and it was like under the big w, w or something like big that. W. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember thinking, oh my god, those palm trees is so exotic. There's a, you know, it's just so exotic compared to Pittsburgh. <laughs> the uh, the the. The, there's a chase at the end where they all scream up the Santa Monica uh, uh, access way, that little freeway thing, that I drive on all the time. And every time I see it, I'm like, that's from Mad 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 World. Oh, my it's God. Such, it's so great. I've got to watch that again. That was a classic. So it's, it's very – I mean, it's got Buster Keaton's in it. The Three Stooges are in it. Three Stooges have the best scene in the whole thing. Wow. I don't remember. What was the scene? It's just They're just not even five seconds on the screen. <laughs> oh my it's God, when the when they're, when they're uh, when the uh, buddy Eb, or when Buddy Hackett and Mickey Rooney are trying to land the plane when Jim Backus gets knocked unconscious. Uh, they're trying to land the plane and the plane's flying over the runway, almost crashing. They just pan down and it's the Three Stooges dressed like firemen. <laughs> and then they just cut the back to the plane. It's like because when they land, it's gonna get worse it's the three stooges yeah, yeah. oh that's very <laughs> three funny stooges are the fire I, have, I have got to watch that again see i didn't appreciate the three stooges because i'm a girl i think that was my problem with an understanding all I, that. I, I, get, I get the girl thing sometimes my yeah. my defense of the stooges is it's just really really dumb comedy like yeah. broad dumb yeah. comedy maybe that's know, why so- broads don't like it <laughs> but I think that it's also, but but so was, but so was Monty Python. But that humor I got. True, true. But I, but I, Python was coming from from a, a completely different angle than a smarter. Don't you think it was a smarter humor? Well, it right? was it was smart humor laid over real simple, big, broad, yeah. physical stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, 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 Ministry of Silly Walks. If you just do that on a vaudeville stage, you'd get a laugh. <laughs> But if you yeah. but if you lay over a dude with an umbrella and a bowler and he's going to work at the Ministry of Silly Walks, you know it's 
it just ta- it just takes the it, yeah. it, it decorates the bat oh, that you hit the awesome. audience with. That's so awesome. Hey, and we're gonna get to your story in just a second because I want to hear more about California sober. Mm. But in the meantime, did you watch the new George Carlin doc? I haven't seen it yet. No, I should. Oh I should. my gosh, you're in for such yeah, a treat. The first half of the George Carlin doc. It's like old school, right? Everything's in black and white. I mean, it's stuff that I didn't know anything about, and maybe you won't either, because it's they really go back. It's extremely thorough. And at the end of the first half, they just, you know, he's been doing all this stand-up, but he doesn't, he can't find his place. And at the end of the first half, they take a shot of his notebook, and he has just scrawled, fuck everybody. And then it ends. <laughs> oh, okay. It ends the first half. And now the second half starts with, Boom, the George Carlin that we know. And, you know, yeah. he has now risen above all of it. And it is so good. You're going to love it. This, uh, good. I love it. There's always a good rise above moment, I think. Yeah. Re- I mean, for a comedian like that, you know, to have just he he went through so much of the grind and trying to find his footing. And finally, he just said, fuck everybody, man. And it's just it's a great doc. You're going to love it. Yeah, good. All right, you guys, we're going to get to Blaine's story in just a second, but I did want to remind you that we are playing Story Smash, the storytelling game show, every month at the Hollywood Improv. The next show is uh, June 25th, which is over now. The next show after that is in July, and I don't have a date yet. But when I know, you'll know. And you can check out StorySmashShow.com for more information, and also follow Story Smash on Instagram at Story Smash, because that's where all the sassy pictures are. Now, Blank Patch, you're not on Instagram, but I always hashtag Blank Patch in my posts. <laughs> I think I'm on it, but I just never, never post. I have yeah. an account, but I don't. It's I too never much. Post. It's too much. My sometimes. wife is my wife is Instagram, and I'm Twitter. Oh, I like that. I like that. Yeah. If you ever hashtag your name, if you just go into you know the URL there at the top of the screen and write in hashtag Blank Patch, it's going to be all me. And I want you to know that I'm not stalking you. Because I know where you live already, so I'm not... You know, I, I rarely go to Facebook, but when I do, it's, it's all Story Smash. <laughs> I haven't been on yeah. Facebook since, since 2015. Since the Clinton administration. I hear you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, you guys. It's easier right now. Blanca Patch, you hear him talking. He is a comedian and a writer and a performer, and he was a game show host. And you've written for a lot of good stuff, like the Martin Short Show and At Midnight, also Mind of Mencia, and you wrote for Jiminy Glick. Which is like, uh, oh my God, Jiminy Glick is like my favorite character of all time. How was working with Martin Short? Uh, can I say I, I didn't write any of the Jiminy stuff? He would write his own Jiminy stuff. Okay. When I was on the I was on the Martin Short show, I left Mad TV with uh, Mike Short, who was another writer on Mad. It, Mike is Martin's brother. Oh. We were we were good friends, and uh, Mike said, "Hey, Martin is doing a show that's supposed to be like a, a talk show." It's like uh, Mike Douglas meets SCTV. I'm like, I'm in. I'm totally yeah. in. And so uh, <laughs> went over there, and Martin was trying to do – this was before the Grove was built, back when it was just the farmer's market. Wow. And we went down to the farmer's market, and Martin wanted to do, like, a uh, 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 hidden camera stuff where he played a, a, he played a character who was a little touched, a little touched in the head. And uh, he would be working at one of those kiosks making food, and they were just going to set him up being a goofball yeah. and messing with people. But people came down, and they would uh, uh, they'd walk up to the counter and go, "You're Martin Short," ah. <laughs> and he and it whoa yeah. flashes and, and people autographs. Yeah, he couldn't couldn't be. do it. So uh, so he came up with uh, he put the fat suit on and became Jiminy Glick. How, so people how, wouldn't recognize where him. Where do you buy a fat suit? I mean, I guess I guess you can just buy I don't, a fat I, suit. I think he he based it on a Canadian guy. I can't remember who the Canadian, but a guy who was like this in Canada. Yeah, just so. And exciting. he was like a bit. And he just was like, he's like a, a larger guy, so we'll get a fat suit, put him in there. It's a very SCTV thing. They were always using dummy shots and fat suits and things. And uh, uh, and and he's Jiminy Glick is more like the actual Martin Short than than any other Martin Short. I, I believe could, that. that. I, I believe that because he's so he's friendly so, he, and so over like over likable, like so likable and pretending to be over likable. So, he's like so engaged, <laughs> but then it comes back to him, and sometimes in that. Fat suit. He would just roll oh. off the stage. Wow. <laughs> he, the thing I liked about Jiminy was he was really vicious, like yeah. the, like 
friendly, but and but very cutting and vicious. And that was how that was how Marty was. He, was he very, could get away with it like, because mm. yeah, he could get away with it because because he was Jiminy Glick, and his yeah. his pattern of talking would be so funny. Like you know, <laughs> like, just, just crazy gibberish. What a your talent. career! Your career went nowhere. What's that like? <laughs> I was like, Spielberg, now, have you ever, ever, no Oscars yet? Well, I have one, two, one, two, one, two, so no Oscars. Boy, oh boy, that must have been a good time working with that talented man. He was, he was, it was something else. That's it was a, awesome, it was a, man. Uh, uh, it was a blast. The show, the show was kind of doomed because it was, it was a syndicated talk show and it was on in different markets and different times all over the country so it would be like in the mornings in some places and at night in other places so you couldn't do late night stuff in the morning right and you couldn't do tame morning stuff at night and it kind of got just got just got swamped but it was just a just a wonder wonderful show and he was always funny well, always funny that guy i think it's just wonderful how you know as you go through decades in la you meet these people and you get to work with this talent and i mean i I like to say to myself, that's the reward. That's the day to day. That's the happiness, getting to do it. You know what I mean? Like just being part of it. Just the idea that you get called over to the farmer's market to ha- hang out with Martin Short and ha- have him do things or, you know, come up with things. That's the joy, right? Is that the joy? That's the joy. It is the joy, I think. There's. It's not the it's- big house with the driveway and the garage, is it? No, no. It's, it's, li- it's well, there's that. But, but I haven't it's, had it's that li- yet. I haven't had that. <laughs> have, no. have you had that? No, not yet. That's what I mean. No. It's you know, I mean I, I used to say if I was in it for the money I wouldn't be in it. Right. But I mean it's like I'm a little old to be saying that. I it's uh, uh but everything's fine over here. I have no complaints. No, 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 but me it's, too. But it me but too. it but it's like I last night I went to see uh Weird Al and Emo, Emo Phillips, Phillips at the Will Turn. Oh. And it was, and Emo is is one of my heroes, and he's also one of my friends now. Oh. And he and he called me before the show, and he goes, oh. "Hey, are you doing anything this weekend?" I said, "Yeah, we're coming to see you." He was calling to invite me to the show. That's amazing. And it gave me, it gave me such a thrill. Yeah. And then when I was right, uh, writing on Mad TV, uh, we did a, a Halloween episode, and I was in charge of the Halloween episode, and, and the guest was Kiss. Oh my god. So I got to work with Kiss for a week, Fun. and I got to do this joke where they all come into the the thing and they all have their Halloween candy bags, right? And they uh, uh, and they go, "What do you? What did you get?" And Paul Stanley goes, "I got a popcorn ball." And then uh, Ace Fraley says, uh, "I got three musketeers." <laughs> and then Peter Gene Simmons, uh, yeah. And then Gene Simmons goes, uh, uh, "I got a." Grape zots, <laughs> and then uh, Peter Chris pulls out a rock, and he goes, "I got a rock." Right, and then he takes a bite of it, <laughs> and he goes, uh, "Oh, I like rock." <laughs> but but I was thrilled because I got to have Kiss do a Peter a Charlie Brown joke. Yeah. I got a rock, yeah. and I got to get Gene Simmons to say grape zots. Unbelievable. And I just, I just, and it's such a stupid little victory. No, it's not even huge. a victory. That's huge. You tell that to 12 year old Blanca Patch and he'd say success. It means nothing to anyone but me, but I got Gene Simmons to say grape yeah. socks. Do you remember when, because I know you and I graduated the same year of uh, high school. So I think. 83? Yeah, I think our music is somewhat similar. Do you remember when the solo albums came out of Kiss and their I faces do. were on the vinyl? Mm-hmm. What? Yeah. That was unbelievable. I remember when they took the makeup off. Do you remember oh, when they yeah. took the makeup well, off? That was and very dramatic. It was a big they had a big announcement on MTV and they go, Now here they are, kiss without their makeup. <laughs> and then they would go, Paul Stanley. And then they would cut to Paul Stanley sitting there with his makeup off for like five seconds. Uh. Just looking at and he Gene Simmons, and then it's the camera on him, just so that you could look at them without That's their makeup. That's so insulting in a way. That's sort of, yeah. you know, like, oh. It was aw- awkward. They signed on Five for seconds it, is a long time. It is a long time, but they signed on for it. And my, what I've heard about Gene Simmons over many, many decades is that he is, you'll never meet somebody cheaper than Gene Simmons unless it was Gilbert Gottfried and he passed. <laughs> but Gene uh. Simmons apparently is just like, he won't give any tickets to radio stations, or like no comps. He didn't get rich writing a lot of checks. 
Uh, Gene, Gene Simmons is what is what he is. Yeah, I know. I, hear I will. You. I will. I will say Paul Stanley is uh, is was could not be cooler or yeah. friendlier. I, he was I'm a, so a, glad he was, to hear that because he was yeah, like a good rock star. The love child, man. I loved him yeah. so much. Oh my gosh! He was great. And then wasn't Ace? Oh no, it was Peter Chris had the Beth song, right? Peter Chris sang Beth. Yeah. Yes. That song was so beautiful and spoke to an entire generation of people, but it was only like a minute and a half long. <laughs> Why yeah, is that I'd song have... so short? Uh, I think because Peter Chris was singing it. Yeah. Maybe that was it. <laughs> I forget I forget who played it. Somebody played it on piano, but it was very unkiss like Yeah. Yeah. I had that 45. I was in fourth grade when that song yeah, came Yeah. That was a great song, man. Yeah, it still it a is one. a great song. Absolutely. Uh, all right, you guys. You've also written, well, look, we could go on and on, but you are quite a talent. <laughs> anyway, that's my story about You guys, find Blaine over on Twitter at Blaine Capatch. You're the funniest goddamn person on Twitter, Blaine. I'm telling you, people just, I mean, I know you know because you have the followers but do you when do 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 like i don't have my notifications on for twitter but if you can't possibly have your notifications on for twitter because if you did your your phone would just be beep 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 all day i don't i don't have them on my phone yeah but you know i just i keep track of stuff yeah <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> oh it's all written down <laughs> yeah i'm not i'm not like i i don't i don't gauge myself on on that kind of stuff but uh uh i have a lot of followers and i'm very i'm delighted and proud of it Aww. and i i uh, i i thank them for following me and i try to stay funny and be upbeat and positive you and are. not be a you negative are. guy you're a very upbeat person on twitter and i also really like the people that respond you get a lot of smart responses so that's a fun yeah thing. the people the, the people that follow me are are, are are very friendly and nice and and uh, I follow people who are friendly and nice and who are funny. Yeah. So my feed is is nice, smart, funny people and it's That's you know, what people I like complain as well. people complain about Twitter. I'm like, why don't you Yeah, who are why you? Why don't following? you follow smart, funny, nice people? Yeah, why are you following the crazy talk? I mean just follow the yeah. good stuff. Absolutely. I agree. One of my favorite things on Twitter is to follow uh, Kruger National Park. Oh man, I get deep into that. It's over in Africa close to the Serengeti and you know it's just like um you know male lion under the crocodile bridge you know now you know like you know oh, okay just big giraffe, wildlife photos yeah, giraffe fight happening on the west side of the Tangiers <laughs> bridge like it's so awesome I feel like I'm right it's like there. next door but in yeah but in the Serengeti it's so great I love it so much how about next door by the way could you hear one more catalytic converter getting stolen what is that <laughs> Uh, I, a coyote just ate another one of my neighbor's dogs. It's, my neighbor's putting up another poster. It's all coyotes and catalytic converters and people that have lost their <laughs> birds. So many people lose their birds, and I don't think they're coming back. Yeah. Warning, I'm in your neighborhood looking through your window. <laughs> <laughs> the guy Warning, just, he I'm used to to tell people. Stealing your catalytic converter right <laughs> yeah. now. Come down. <laughs> I'm porch pirating this box of wine you got from Bevmo. <laughs> All right, let's talk about California sober. All right, you guys, wherever Speaking you are. Speaking of box of wine. Put your hands together for the very talented Blanca Patch. Oh, hey, hi. Hi, Christine. I didn't hear you come in. Uh, Christine said, hey, why don't you talk about sobriety? Because I just, I, I wasn't really a big drinker, but during the pandemic, I was having a couple of drinks a day, and it was becoming a ritual, and it was pointless, and it was just making me, uh, uh, I would get right up to the edge of knowing how much I could have without being hung over the next day because I was at home with my wife, and I didn't want to be hung over in front of my wife. But I would have a couple of drinks every night, and it was just getting to be an expensive drag. So uh, at the beginning, at the at the, the the March that we went into lockdown, I guess that Friday the thirteenth, I figured, hey, I'll take March off. I'm just going to take a break on in March. I'm just not going to drink, and I just stopped drinking. I didn't quit. I just stopped. I just didn't didn't drink. And uh, and it wasn't really a problem. And then I got to the end of I got to the end of the month, and uh, and I was like, I'm just going to keep going. And I kept going, and it's been a year and almost four months, I guess. And I do not miss it at all. But I but I smoke marijuana all day every day. It's, it's I've done it for decades since I lived in in Baltimore. If I could if I could find marijuana, I would have it. So, uh, 
but I'm not like a, you know, Mosimo dude wearing a Rastafarian bong shirt with, you know, hemp army pants and stuff. I'm not, I, I don't like marijuana culture, but, uh, but I like marijuana. But anyway, it was just the, the uh, the drinking, stopping drinking was, was easy and fun. And marijuana is, uh, uh, is a little harder to knock off because it's, because I don't need alcohol, but I think, and maybe this is just the addiction talking, but, uh, 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 but I need marijuana because it slows my thoughts down enough so that I can think them. So that's, uh, that's my anxiety control. And I think that, uh, uh, this California sober, as it's been called, which I, which I love, I was, I've, uh, uh, uh it seems to work for a lot of people because you get the, you can't be in 2022 and not be on something. Right? Well, I don't know about that. I mean, like, <laughs> like I'm on Paxil, which is an antidepressant. So I don't cry anymore, which is kind of nice. Um, okay. But, uh, but I also smoke, uh, I smoke a lot of weed as well. Um, I, I remember hearing Rodney Dangerfield said that he didn't smoke weed two days in his life. And that was when he was in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he had surgery. <laughs> there was uh, my friend, uh, 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 my friend Jeff Schimmel, who was Robert Schimmel's brother. You know Robert Schimmel, the yeah. late great. I worked with Jeff. We became friends writing on Mind of Mencia. And uh, uh, and he's really, really funny and a good guy. And he um, uh, he's conservative, which is very, very conservative. Hmm. So there, I'll, I'll say he's my conservative friend. Yeah, he's the one. <laughs> yeah, he's the one. But he's a, a, he's a fascinating guy, and he's very funny. And he was Rodney's writer for years. He oh, worked wow. on would, would work on Rodney's scripts with him. And when Rodney was in the hospital... He had a heart attack, I guess. Right. And Rodney calls Jeff and he goes, "Hey, Jeff, uh, I'm, in, I'm in the hospital. I needed to. Go, I needed to go into my house and get, bring me my Crown Royal bag. Go into my room. Yeah. It's a f- bottom bottom drawer. Get my Crown Royal bag. I need it. Bring, bring it in here." So he goes over to his Rodney's house and he gets this Crown Royal bag out of his drawer and he takes it to the hospital and he says he gets in there and Rodney's in the emer- like in the ICU. And he's got this one of those IV stands and a bathrobe on. And he's kind of saying, oh, oh, "Oh, hey, how you doing, Jeff?" And Jeff goes in. He hands him the bag. He opens the bag. He takes out all this pot. Uh, uh, gets a joint out of it. Lights it up immediately and starts smoking it. And he's like, "Rodney, should you be smoking marijuana in the ICU? There's like oxygen here and patients and stuff. It's a hospital. Ah, no, don't worry about it." And uh, he said this doctor walks in, like this as a like a joke. Doctor walks in with a clipboard. He looks up and sees Rodney smoking the joint and goes, <laughs> "Rodney, <laughs> that's so cute. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh yeah, knucklehead. Hey, you crazy my, guy. When my dad had open heart <laughs> surgery in 1985, uh. I don't remember this, but my sisters talk about going to see dad at the hospital and talking to the heart surgeons like out in the hallway and they're all smoking like oh, smoking yeah. cigarettes at that time like oh, yeah. heart surgeons smoking cigarettes <laughs> oh like, yeah so crazy People... i'm so glad i i never smoked cigarettes you never did either right i did, did i smoked you? i smoked cigarettes when i was uh, uh when i was a young comic i guess i smoked until my my mid late 30s was that hard to quit that was you know i would i would stop I, like i said with drinking i didn't i didn't quit i just stopped yeah, because I think it's it, that allows your brain to not focus on it a little bit. Because if you if you tell your brain, "I'm I'm quitting this. I'm never going to have another cigarette," your brain goes, "Oh yeah, I yeah. bet you are." Yeah, yeah. and then it finds well, a way to sneak one in there. Well, also you're talking about nicotine, which is nicotine the most is the powerful. Devil. Yeah, they say it's the most powerful. It's like telling somebody, "Don't breathe anymore." Okay, you're good, right? You don't need to breathe. I, like I, it's very, very difficult. I went for a long, long, long time without having a cigarette, and then I was at a party like maybe 15 years ago, and everybody's standing in this backyard around a campfire or whatever, and my sister-in-law is smoking one of those uh, uh, those hand rolled, like whatever yeah. it is the the eagle not sure hand rolled thing i'm like that looks really good you know what i'm gonna have a nice hand rolled cigarette I'm, whatever yeah, I, yeah i can have when i'm a grown-up yeah like i smoke joints so let me have a hand rolled cigarette exactly and uh, uh and so she rolls one up for me 
and uh, and I light it, and I have a couple of drags, and I am sweating and gray, Ugh. and I thought I was going to throw up. I, my heart started racing. I'm like, oh, right, this is nicotine. It's really, yeah. really, it's a powerful drug that you have to acclimate yourself to. Yeah. Like a sword and then, in and Dungeons & Dragons. As, as soon as you acclimate, you're hooked. And then, then it, that's it. That's Yeah, the you're thinking, how can I get around this acclimation part just, just to have, enjoy a you know, regular cigarette? Right. How so when, 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 when you decided to stop drinking, did you finish the bottle you were drinking? Or did you, did you throw it away? Did you give it away? You know, I kind of knew that I was going to take the month off. And so I, had a, I, had, I was drinking really good tequila. I was, I'm a mm-hmm. tequila snob. I was drinking Kinchinaco and Yeho, mm. and, uh, which was my favorite. And I still would love to have one. It was mm-hmm. just delicious, but I won't. And uh, I kind of timed it out. It was the last day of February was my last drink. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, uh, but you know what? I still have dreams where I will, and they're re- like recent ones, where yeah. I have a drink or I have a couple of drinks. And in all those dreams, I'm either thinking to myself, why did I do that? Why did I blow this cool run that I had? I had yeah, yeah. I over a year. Because yeah, like now it's, now it's just I don't want to ruin the run. Yeah. But in my dream, I was like, I re- why did I do that? Why did I have this? I you get ruined mad at it. yourself. Yeah, Red yeah, mad at yeah. myself. And the other uh, dreams that I would have would be I'm going to have one, and then oh no, I reek of booze now, and my wife is going to find out oh. about it. How can I? Oh no, she's going to know that I did this. Yeah. So it would be like me uh, disappointing and letting my family. Were down. you brought up Catholic? No, uh, oh. Presbyterian. Okay. They're it's, a little it's, lighter it's like on the, the guilt. It's yeah. Well, Presbyterian is like the the Lacroix of religion. It's just like <laughs> it's like a lot of fizz, a little, little god in there. You just do it, do whatever you want. Well, no, but I'm talking about like those sorts of deep seated dreams where you feel guilt or you feel you know that you did something wrong or you should have done it that way. That's a lot of Catholic stuff. I mean, at least from my background, well, in terms of feeling guilty, not wanting to let somebody down, like your wife. You know, you don't want her to find out. Then you're going to feel less a man. Or I mean, there's a lot. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't really associate that kind of stuff. I, I get the religious angle of it, but for me, it's just me being guilty about yeah. letting people down, and I don't yeah. want to hurt people or let myself down. Does your it's, wife drink, or does she care? Or? You know, my wife, uh, my wife enjoys a glass of wine. Yeah, perfect. and uh, and I smoke marijuana. And it's like a, 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 it's you know a, a Jack Spratt situation <laughs> it's and it's, you know it's a nice balance she got i got Moder- or she got uh moderna i got pfizer yeah that's nice so i like it. it mix it up mix, mix up the whole up. household it's almost like a mixed race marriage really i it mean really at this is. point i'm I, i'm volkswagen <laughs> she's honda and it works that's it that's it hey listen thank you so much for coming on really i i so oh. appreciate your time and you you've helped me so much in my life blaine i mean i know it sounds silly but like through the through the pandemic, you came through for me show after show. And I, I can't thank you enough because I, I don't know if anybody realizes this, but I only pay Blaine $1,000 a show. That's all I pay him. <laughs> it's not a lot. And, and you know what? Every penny goes up on the screen. <laughs> uh, Christine, you were, uh, uh, I enjoyed, uh, uh, always enjoyed doing the shows during the pandemic. Thanks. They, they uh, uh, I love them for selfishly because they kept me sharp. They yeah. let me. Uh, they let me run new jokes. They yeah. let me contact people and stay in touch with friends of mine and perform uh, when nobody else was performing. So uh, yeah, I can't. Were, th- I can't thank you enough. That's sweet. There are still people that ask me, "When are we doing it again? You know, when are you doing it again? Story Smash. When are you playing again? You know, where everybody can." see the show, whether that be on Rush Ticks or Eventbrite or all those different things. And I think about it. I do want to do it again. I like the idea of bringing people in. A lot of smart people were always commenting. And I did like doing Story Smash that way. But it's a lot of work it to is. get to get all those people on the same page. Like if there was money involved, it would be different. But it's an expensive hobby. It is an expensive hobby. But, you know, yeah. if, if, uh, uh, if we were in it for the money, we wouldn't be doing it. I know. Isn't that the truth? Boy, that is so true. Yeah, I'm going to get into realty. (sighs) (laughs) I'm going to get my realtor's license. Get your real estate license. Yeah, that's what you should do. Yeah, why not? That's the the show. It's a comedian who gives up and becomes a realtor in Van Nuys. That's right. A real estate agent or maybe like a parking, parking meter. That'd be a good one. A comedian who becomes a parking meter lady. 
or person? Uh, 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 lovely Peter. Lovely Peter. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I don't know. It's, what it's that a lovely means. read, a meter maid. Oh, yeah, I'm just trying to think of like Peter, a, a, a meter maid. <laughs> Without without uh, uh, having to pay for it, it just changed. That's the name. right. That's right. I, I, I right. saw too much Weird Al last night. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and Emo Phillips, by the way, didn't I remember him one time? Didn't he say to you one time, "Hey, you stole my act" or something like that? Uh, oh no, uh, uh, he came through Baltimore back when I back when I lived in Baltimore in the eighties. He came through yeah. the Comedy Factory outlet. Yeah, and uh, uh, just one of my heroes, and he gave yeah. me an autographed picture. That said, Dear Blaine, stop impersonating me to get girls. <laughs> and it's a picture of him like wearing pajamas. I remember that. Isn't that funny? I remember that. I don't know where I heard that, but that is so awesome. Yeah, what a talent. Here, by, the, by the way, I'm going to share this to, to Chrissy. This is Emo oh standing gosh. behind my son last night at the Will Turn. Oh my gosh, is that the best picture? Emo Phillips standing right by. Oh, that is so sweet. So you took your son to the show? Yeah. Did he like it? Oh, he loved it. He he lo- he loved he loved Emo. My son my son is going to be a comedian, unfortunately. Oh no, that's a great thing. Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine what's going to come out of that kid. He's very but funny. wait a minute, don't Emo Phillips? Those guys always have great musicians behind them as well. I mean, they come. It's a show. It's a show, right? Well, Emo, Emo is a great musician himself. If you ever watch his show, he'll play clarinet or he'll have like little sort of ragtime kind of musicians with him and I've stuff. I've seen him play ukulele, ukulele, but I don't think I've seen the clarinet. Wow. Yeah, he, uh, uh, and then he, uh, now, I'm, now I'm wondering if it's Berenstain Bears thing. But uh, yeah, I, th- I think he plays clarinet. Hmm. Jesus. But uh, uh, I will say this, and I said it on Twitter this morning. I could not. I was blown away at the musicianship of Weird Al's band. I could not believe they were. They are such great players. I was, I was dumbfounded. Left. I, I was left dumb at yeah. how uh, uh, how good they were. It's Just so impressive. Fantastic music. Isn't that so impressive? You play guitar. Where do you keep your guitar? Because I remember you had you had all these guitars in storage. Do you yeah. have your guitars with you? Yeah, I have a bunch. But are they in your place? Uh, some are, some aren't. I keep. Are you I playing? Keep, are you playing? Yeah, I play all the time. Oh, that's play great. How about, how about your son? Just Is for he going to pick up an instrument? He wants to play cello. I'm going to try to talk him into the bass because I have basses, mm. but his hands are a little small. Just to, you know, and I don't want to get him one of those tiny guitars or a waste of money. Well, you could you could always rent a cello for a little bit of time. You know what I mean? Just rent a cello for a couple months and see what he thinks of it. Well, maybe rent a cello. My child, I I, I used to make my kid, like, I had them learning, like, piano, like, official lessons, and that did not work. And, you know, I tried to, like, push music on her, but now that I don't push anymore, well, maybe about four or five years ago, I started saying, you know what, Pam, you do anything you want with music, but you have to do it for 15 minutes. Like, I don't care if it's the ukulele or the guitar or the piano, whatever you pick up is fine, but do something musical for 15 minutes. And now yeah. I don't have to ask them at all. Now they, my, my kid will just do music for hours. It's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. So you, you got to get the introduction in there. And then once they pick it up, you know, even a little bit, then you really see how exciting it is for them. Them. Yes. If you play for an hour, you'll play for two. Yeah, it's true. And even when my kid was little going to sleep at night, I didn't want her to hear the TV on in the other room going to bed. I always picked up my guitar and started playing or piano or whatever, just play on my own because I want her childhood memories to be, I heard my mom playing instruments at night. Does that make sense? Yeah. And not like a big, loud <laughs> commercial for Blaine Realty. <laughs> Blaine, 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 Blaine on Van Nuys. Number one in Van Nuys. <laughs> keys, 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 keys on Van Nuys. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so much again. You guys find Blaine over there on Twitter at Blaine Patch, and then follow me over there as well at Storyworthy. All right, you guys, one more time on behalf of the very talented Blaine Patch. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. My name is Christine Blackburn saying make it a Storyworthy <laughs> week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. 
Subscribe to StoryWorthy on iTunes and visit the StoryWorthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Oh,